to superpowers and everything in between. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sex, Love, and Superpowers podcast show. I am your host, Tatiana Verande, and today I have with me a very special guest, Dr. Allison Ash, and we are going to be discussing navigating the world of polyamorous dating. So I'm very excited for this conversation because we have not uh, addressed this topic yet on the show, so I'm super happy to have her here. Let me tell you a little bit about her before we get started. Dr. Allison Ash is a sex and intimacy coach and educator and the founder of TurnOn.Love. As a sociologist with a PhD from Stanford, she has a comprehensive understanding of the complex societal challenges that often lead to unsatisfying and disempowering sexual experiences. A champion for others overcoming shame and deepening pleasure, Dr. Ash helps her clients radically explore and courageously express themselves. She designs workshops and offers individuals and couples coaching to give others the tools to discover their desires and confidently pursue them. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I'm going to start you off the way I start off all our lovely guests by asking you to share with our listeners, what are your superpowers? I love this question. (laughs) Um, I've kind of jokingly called myself an intimacy wizard. For the past few years, so I would say that um, creating and sustaining intimacy, emotional, physical, sexual intimacy is a superpower of mine and helping others to do the same. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I love it. We've had the pleasure fairy on the show and we get the intimacy wizard, (laughs) whole cast of characters. This is awesome. You pull Um, in a good crew. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. This is a fun show. I'm telling you. Um, Okay. So. Polyamorous dating or non-monogamous relating relationships, give us sort of an overview because I think that maybe we don't all have a consensus understanding of what that is when we talk about it. Sure. Um, I think that if we're going to talk about non-monogamy, it's important just to spend a moment talking about monogamy because as the default We don't really define it, and there's a lot of assumptions about what monogamy means, and there's actually a lot of variation around what monogamy can look like. Mm -hmm. And so traditionally, monogamy is defined as one partner for your entire life. And so these days, most people who are monogamous are serial monogamous, meaning they have one relationship and then they go to the next. And, um, And yet, when we think about monogamy, different couples, especially in different parts of the world or different, uh, coming from different kinds of religions, are going to view different things as falling under the category of exclusivity or not. So if you kiss your friends on the lips, if you cuddle with your friends, if you confide your deepest secrets and ask for emotional support from your friends, um, are those things considered cheating or are they within bounds of what's considered monogamy? And so I think that whether you're monogamous or not, one of the things that I would love uh, for the listeners of this show to leave this episode with is this sense of curiosity and desire to talk with current or future partners and lovers about how do we want to structure our relationship? What feels important to uh, make agreements around? Is there anything that needs to feel exclusive or special between the two of us? Where are we comfortable and open with sharing and exploring and what feels important to talk about so that we feel safe in this relationship because safety is paramount in all relationship structures for intimacy to flourish. Flourish. So um, if you're monogamous, great, no worries. I don't have a hierarchy of uh, what is ideal. I think that monogamous relationships can be beautiful. And even though you're in a monogamous relationship, I think it's still worthwhile to define uh, to, to explore some of these topics. Now, if we're thinking about non-monogamous relationships, there are also a thousand ways to organize and structure non-monogamy, right? So you could have um, <clears throat> couples that are monogamish. So maybe they're mostly <laughs> monogamous, right? But there's a little wiggle room. So I've I, heard that one before. I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, 
you know, so for example, some couples, they have a kissing rule where they can kiss anybody they want, but maybe not anything more or a hundred mile rule where if they're like a hundred miles from one another, they have free reign to do what they want. But if they're less than a hundred miles from each other, or maybe a hundred miles from home, they're monogamous. So, you know, there's some really creative arrangements people have created to start to explore some amount of freedom and novelty and variety without completely opening up their relationship. Mm -hmm. And I really, I love, I love just giving people the encouragement and permission because sometimes we need permission from others, which is like, you know, that's a whole other conversation, but, but that's a thing, right? Sometimes people feel like, okay, like this person said it was okay. That's like, I can say it's okay for myself to just, to just explore and to, to question those boundaries and to, and to really, um, be willing to dialogue about it and make your own agreements, regardless of, of whether you're in a monogamous relationship or not. I, I think it's so important. And, and I really, I can't stress that enough, how important that is, because I think the more that we can, we can do that for ourselves in our own relationships the more we shift a cultural paradigm and the less judgment we have of people who choose to do it differently. Yes, exactly. And it's so empowering when you realize that there's not a specific way that your relationships have to look or be structured. The whole world opens up to you. And when you realize that there are people out there that are going to want to engage in the kind of relationship structures that you want, it's very liberating. Mm -hmm. Totally. Okay. So we have to go to a quick break. Obviously, this is going to be a very juicy conversation and you're going to want to stay tuned. So we'll be right back. We've been talking with Dr. Allison Ash about navigating the world of polyamorous dating more when we get back. Stay tuned. Are you here to change the world? Do you talk about things like vibration, frequency, awakening, and consciousness? Are you pretty sure you have superpowers? The Superpower Net is unlike normal coaching programs and conscious communities. We provide training, intuitive guidance, peer-to-peer learning, intensive one-on-one coaching, and a high vibrational network of people just like you. When you join the Net, you get 24-7 access to a collaborative group of people who support you as you master your personal power and unlock your superpowers. If you're ready to use your superpowers to change the world, then join the Superpower Net today. Visit superpowerexperts.com slash the net to learn more. Okay, so before we went to break, you sort of um, talked about or mentioned there's like a whole plethora of different ways you could structure a non-monogamous experience. Can you sort of give a give a taste of some of those and what you, what you see is maybe more common or just some, some arrangements that you have found that really, really worked for people. Totally. And I think that the way that one of the best ways to structure this conversation is to think about it in terms of different variables that affect the kinds of relationship structures people might want. So for example, the first one is access. Do people want more closed access or more open access? So if they want more closed access. So, hold on. I just want to pause you for a second, sure. for a second, because I'm not sure what you mean by access. Oh yeah. Yeah, totally. Access. I mean, I mean, um, uh, availability of partners, right? Like access to other people in your relationship. So an example of closed access would be monogamish, right? You're mm-hmm. mostly closed. Maybe every once in a while you have a little bit of fun with other people, but it's not really a fully open relationship versus something that's completely open, like um, an open relationship or an open marriage where there's a primary partnership, but each individual has the freedom to have other relationships with other people. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one, that's one point is access. How, how much access do you want? How open versus how closed do you want your relationship to be? And there's a whole bunch of options within that range. The second variable I would say that's really important is focus. Do you want the focus of your explorations to be about the individual, about a couple, or about a group? And if it's about an individual, maybe something like solo poly would be really great. Solo poly is a kind of relationship structure where I guess essentially the individual is the individual's own primary, right? Like they are in a relationship with themselves and that's first and foremost. And so they might avoid any kind of couple centric or hierarchical structures because they um, are committed to kind of that sense of independence and freedom and self-determination. So 
I just want to, I want to flush that out a little bit more in terms of like what that actually looks like or means. Um, So I was solo poly for several years. um, And what that looked like for me is I felt a lot of freedom and I didn't make a lot of relationship agreements with the lovers that I had in my life. Um, When we did make relationship agreements, they were not um, about constricting my sense of freedom with other partners. It was about increasing safety and intimacy in the dynamics that I was a part of. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's very much non-hierarchical, right? Like I'm not choosing to value one relationship over another. Um, I'm choosing to value my own independence and freedom and autonomy. um, and, And then within that, seeing what kind of intimacy was available to me. And then do you when you're in that kind of experience, do you make that really clear from before you engage in intimacy with another person? Yeah, I think that having transparent communication is really important. And I think it's also really important to know where are you willing to be flexible and where are you not open to compromise? And so for me to get to say in some periods of my life, like I'm solo poly, I'm getting my PhD and I'm doing all of these things and my life is really full and I don't have the capacity to have a a primary relationship in my life right now. And this is what I'm available for is one type of conversation you can have. Or you could say, currently I'm really solo poly and I've been enjoying this, but these are the other kinds of non-monogamy that I feel open to exploring at some point in my life. And, you know, this is just kind of where I'm at right now. And Give it like, what are you open to? What are you interested in? Like, let's negotiate, talk about what might work best for us. Right? So, so great, great segue. What are some of the other yeah. kinds of non-monogamy that you might be interested in exploring at some point? Totally. So if you're couple focused, you might want to have a unicorn, right? A couple who dates a third <laughs> person together. <laughs> And I love the term unicorn because finding a unicorn can be as difficult as finding them, you know, mythical uh-huh. unicorn like horse animal that <laughs> exists, right? Because it can be very hard for a couple to find a third who wants to date them. Uh, but it exists and I've actually been the unicorn in some dynamics before and it's quite has a lot of beautiful things to offer. So that's another option. Mm-hmm. And if you're group oriented, you might want to be a part of a triad or a quad or um, one of the, the these terms that are really coming to be popular right now is a, a poly tribe or a polycule, maybe even a pack, right? So these are all kinds of different ways of organizing groups of people, three, four, more, who all have some kind of constellation of interrelated relationships. Uh, so in a poly uh, tribe or a pack you might be, there might be five people and I could be dating two of the people. And then maybe one of my partners is dating two other people who's dating, you know, like there's some kind of constellation of relationships. And yeah, even though I might not be dating or sleeping with everybody in the poly tribe, we're all committed to having relationships with each other and knowing one another and supporting each other in our relationships with other people in the tribe. And so it's very much like, um, one of the terms that I've heard is a kitchen table poly. Like let's all gather together on the kitchen table and talk about how things are going for us. So this, this is, this is all very fascinating to me. I've been married for almost 10 years. So I, and I, I feel like there have been sort of more developments and in the, this, the world of dating and, and polyamory that have come more to the forefront in that time that I've been married. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated by it because I don't have any direct experience with it. One thing that comes up for me when I hear about something like a, a quad or a tribe or a pack, it's like, it sounds super complicated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's being non-monogamous offers a lot of opportunities for self-growth and development and exploring core beliefs and core wounds and attachment styles and all of this stuff. When I, when I counsel folks who are just starting to explore non-monogamy, I say that I think in order to be successful, you need three things. A mentor who has done it before, they can offer Mm -hmm. support and advice and share their own experiences. Community. It is really hard to do this alone. So find community. 
know what are available. I mean, the Bay Area, we're so fortunate. We have poly potlucks and poly family get togethers and poly happy hours and all these play parties and all these opportunities to meet other people. Um, and I would say it's really important to have that kind of community because we live in a world that tells us that monogamy is the way that we're supposed to do it. Mm-hmm. So whenever you're challenging the dominant paradigm, we need as much support as we can get, which leads me to the third thing, which is some sort of coach or therapist. Because when you're exploring this stuff, your your old deep wounds are going to come to the surface. Mm-hmm. And that's an opportunity. And I want you to be supported to be able to take advantage of that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I mean, cause I know, I know just how, how transformative and powerful being in a committed partnership has been for me. You know, it's been, it's been like a spiritual path, not like it has been a spiritual path for my husband and I. Um, and it's been hard, but there's something about the commitment to the container that has provided this like crucible, if you will, for really intense and, and potent transformation to occur. So how, um, so, so yeah, I'm just like, I have no, I have no frame of reference or context to put what that could be like in a poly experience, um, outside of, you know, back when I was dating or sleeping with random people before I met my husband, which was like, I was in a totally different time of life. So it's just fascinating to me as I'm just like, I want to, I want to hear more. (laughs) <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm curious because what I, what I have also seen on the flip side and kind of like a shadow element is, is what, what it seems to me can happen is that there can be people who use polyamory as an excuse to sort of not face their stuff. Totally. I know a lot of people that use non-monogamy as a way to avoid commitment or uh, to avoid looking at some of the things that can become barriers to deep, deep lasting intimacy. But I have to say, one of the biggest misconceptions about non-monogamous relationships that I've encountered is this idea that you cannot cheat in non-monogamy. And that's just not accurate. Hmm, Say more about that. Yeah, like various non-monogamous relationships have different levels of agreements. So Mm -hmm. I think I mentioned earlier that you could have an open relationship. One of the third variables is power, right? So do you want a hierarchical relationship or an egalitarian relationship or something that's fluid? And in a hierarchical structure, you have a primary relationship and that primary relationship has the capacity to create agreements and rules Um, and set boundaries that can dictate how the partners can relate to their other relationships. So for example, if you and I are in a primary relationship, we might have an agreement around um, safer sex, for example. So you and I can become what's called fluid bonded, meaning that we don't use barriers for protection in our sexual experiences. But we have an agreement that we are not fluid bonded with any other person, meaning that we're always using safer sex practices. And if you were to be having a sexual experience with your partner, other partner of two years, and you decide to not use a condom with him before telling me about it and talking to me about it and seeing if I was okay, that's cheating because you're breaking an agreement that we have. Mm -hmm. And that we both agree to, even though this is with somebody that you are a partnership with that I might love and appreciate and support Mm -hmm. your relationship with. Mm -hmm. So when we have agreements, we, we create agreements in order to support safety and security. And the thing is, is that, you know, I think that there's this, there's this balance between safety and security and growth and freedom. And different relationships are going to put the emphasis on different sides of that continuum, right? And even if you have a high value on freedom and autonomy and growth, that needs to be supported by having some element of safety and security. And so even in non-monogamous relationships, people are often creating agreements in order to support safety and security and realizing that those agreements are fluid and maybe later in the relationship we're going to amend them because there's a big enough foundation of safety and security. We don't need those agreements anymore. But when agreements are in place and we willfully ignore them or go counter to things that we've agreed to, that's breaking our word and that's a form of cheating. Right. Yeah, totally. Totally. 
Um, what do you see as some of the biggest obstacles to non-monogamy or one of the, some of the biggest challenges that you see people brushing up against? Communication issues. I mean, I think that those are honestly at the core of so many relationships of all yeah, sorts of structures. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> but having communication be dialed in is essential to be able to navigate non-monogamy effectively. And this can come up in a couple different ways. I mean, it's amazing how many people I see still being less than honest or transparent, kind of fudging a little bit as like a carryover from monogamy, mm. right? Because that's the thing is that when you have rules in place, and there's a punishment for breaking the rule, mm -hmm. it's going to lead people to be dishonest because they don't want to face that punishment. Right, or the shame that comes with acknowledging that they've yeah, done Yeah, exactly. Um, and so even when they move into a non-monogamous arrangement, that there can be some kind of holdover of this ten habitual tendency to kind of obscure facts around the ways that you might be connecting with other people. At the same time, I think it's really important to come up with agreements around communication with your various partners. How much information do they want? What level mm -hmm. of detail? When do they want to be told it? In what format do they want to be told? Most people think that face-to-face -face is the best way to communicate. And I have to say that in some instances, I know people, myself included, who would prefer to have it be shared via email. So if I have something that might be upsetting, if I get it via email, I can have my explosive, unelegant reaction <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> come back into a place of regulation on my own and then have a more effective and fruitful conversation with somebody. Mm -hmm. right? So there are all sorts of ways that we can communicate. Um, and then even within that, realizing that fair is not equal. And this is a really important concept that I want to share because most of us think that fair is equal. So if you want a lot of details, then it's only fair if you give me a lot of details. Mm -hmm. But maybe you like details. Maybe details has you feel safer because then you don't have to imagine the worst case scenario in your mind. And maybe for me, I don't want a lot of details because that makes me feel more jealous or because then I'm going to get into a comparative cycle. And it's easier for me to support your relationships if I have kind of broad strokes, but not a lot of details. So if that's the case, then I would support us coming up with an agreement where I give you lots of details and you don't give me lots of details. And even though that's not equal, that's completely fair. Yeah. I mean, it really comes down to knowing yourself and knowing knowing what works and what doesn't work for you. And I'm sure that especially if you're new to, to non-monogamy, that that is a learning curve. Mm -hmm. That there's, you know, it's like you kind of discover it through the process of going through it. That's right. And you know, so, and that's why it's nice to have a mentor who's gone through some of these things before that could say, have you considered, mm -hmm. or did you know that this is also an option? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's trial and error, just like all of our relationships are trial sure. and error. I mean, hopefully our relationships get continually better because we learn so much from our previous ones about what we want and don't want. And, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this is awesome. I'm so appreciating everything that you're bringing forward. Um, I mean, I feel like we've, we've kind of jumped around and, and danced around in a lot of different, different topics in here. Is there, is there something that you feel like we haven't covered that you really want to make sure our listeners receive from this conversation? Well, just in case there are any people out there taking notes that heard me mention that there are four kinds of variables that can determine relationship structure, I just want to offer the last one, which is drive. Are you um, focused on your autonomy and your selfhood? So something like solo poly would be great. Or is your drive more about sexual intimacy, in which case maybe being swingers or having friends with benefits could be ideal? Or is your drive intimacy? And if your drive is intimacy, maybe you want to have more of these kinds of like triads or quads. Or maybe, you know, the other thing to consider is that you can have non-sexual intimacy. That might be your mm -hmm. drive. So like a sensual friendship where you have intense emotional attraction and a lot of physical intimacy, but maybe not sexual intimacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's really, I mean, that is, takes a lot of self inquiry and self self discovery to know which one of those is driving you. And the willingness to be honest, because as you mm -hmm. mentioned earlier, shame is just such a barrier for us. And we might think, okay, it's okay to be non-monogamous, but being solo poly or having my autonomy be the driving focus, that's wrong. 
or you might think like, um, I mean, even in a non-monogamy community, there are some people that believe having an egalitarian relationship power structure is better than having something that's hierarchical. So there is opportunities to even be shamed in a non-monogamous paradigm for wanting what you want. And what I want to offer out there is that there's no one right way to structure a relationship and that it's important to be honest with yourself so that you can be honest with your partners around what are your values? What are your priorities? I mean, when you're thinking about exploring non-monogamy, people do that for so many reasons, right? They could want variety or validation, or they like the thrill of the chase, or they have curiosity about experiences and want to learn and grow, or they want more pleasure or more emotional intimacies, or maybe they want to go to play parties or have group sex, or there could be a difference of desire. Maybe one of you is hornier, kinkier, queerer than the other, or likes different kinds of sex. There could be different values around freedom, autonomy, believing that one person can't or shouldn't meet all of your needs, Um, a desire to have direct experiences around unconditional love or abundance, right? There's so many reasons people want to explore non-monogamy. And I think that it's important to figure out what is driving you so that you can make sure whatever relationship structure you end up in, it supports that the reason why you're exploring non-monogamy in the first place, right? Yes. And, and to, I just, I love that you emphasize that there is no one right way to do this relationship thing, because I think whether we're monogamous or not, we can, we can very easily fall into this place of my way is the right way. And oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, I, we're seeing that across all sorts of different topics right now. And, mm-hmm. and I just, I, like, I keep coming back to this there is no one right way to do this. There are a variety of ways and what works for you might not work for me. And that doesn't mean that it's wrong. It doesn't mean that it's better and that I should feel shame because I'm not doing it. Um, because that's a thing too that can happen. Um, it's just, it's about preference. It's about our personal preference and, and being true to that and following that and being willing to acknowledge it and to to own it. That's right. Yeah, well said. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you so, 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 so much for the work that you're doing. It's so Mm -hmm. needed. Um, I definitely know where I'm sending people who are interested in polyamory um, and and exploring all of the different things. You you run workshops and, and stuff about this. You run courses. Um, clearly you know what you're talking about and you're holding a very non-judgmental space around it. So I just want to appreciate you and thank you for that. Well, thank you. Yeah. It's, um, I have to say that, you know, I think exploring my own sexuality has been the most powerful vehicle of self growth and empowerment. Mm -hmm. And it's just so inspiring to witness other people on that journey and to be able to explore intimacy intentionally as a way of also exploring themselves is a beautiful, beautiful journey to be on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, well, to our listeners, I hope this was valuable for you. I know I got a lot out of it. Um, Dr. Ash is obviously a wealth of information and until next time, take this, do your deep inquiry. What, what are you doing and why is always, I think, a really powerful question to ask ourselves. What do you want and why do you want it? And what needs to shift or change in your life so that you can have what you want without feeling shame or judgment around it? Yeah. And I actually have a free gift for the listeners out there. Beautiful. If you go to my website, www.turnon.love slash free gift, there is a packet of handouts that are all geared towards helping you deepen intimacy in your relationships. So I hope you'll take some time to check that out. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. And um, yes, to our listeners again, I love you. Thank you for tuning in. And until next time, go out and love yourself so that you can love the world more deeply. Many, many blessings. 
Are you ready to discover your superpowers? Go now to superpowerexperts.com and take the superpower quiz today.